Hello and good evening everyone. My name is Kathy Fries and I'm a Purple Martin landlord located in the very small town of Licking, Missouri. Tonight I would like to talk to you about how I have built a super colony of Purple Martin landlords across Missouri. To give you some historical, historical perspective and take you back to when I first became a Purple Martin landlord, let's go to 2007. So a short description of Licking, we are located in Texas County, Missouri, a small area of 1,179 square miles with a population of approximately 25,000. My colony started in 2007 and currently I host approximately 84 pair each year. After reading on the PMCA site, John Barrow's article on Last Testament to the Purple Martin, I decided that I too wanted to extend my, purple, my support of Purple Martins far beyond my backyard. Initially, my goal with my small colony was to achieve a super colony status, that is, of 100 pair. But after a couple of summers managing my site, I finally came to the conclusion that with a full-time job, a super colony would just not be practical for me. But I still wanted to help increase the population of the Purple Martin. Part of my decision making in whether to build or not build a super colony in May 2009, we experienced a tornado with 100 mile per hour sustained winds, and that caused me to quickly reconsider the consequences of having a large colony wiped out in a single event. Besides the hot summers here in Missouri, that which also caused me to reconsider, I decided that I wanted to improve the quality of the sites around me to which my nestlings would disperse next year as subadults. Taking a drive around Missouri, I noticed the condition of much of the housing out there. It contained English house sparrows and starlings. Many of the houses were just not even manageable uh, for raising and lowering. A lot didn't even have predator guards. So in 2009-2010, I set some short-term goals for myself. And instead of adding more housing, I determined that I could help my fledges more when they returned as subadults by improving the surrounding sites. In this way, I could contribute to the effort and have a, and have a larger impact by involving more people. The short-term goals that I set were outreach to current and potential new Purple Martin landlords using our local newspapers at a, as a communications medium. I would help these landlords identify goals and form a mentor relationship, mentor and protege relationship with them. Educate them via my monthly newsletter. And then I could help improve the current housing sites to increase the Puma nesting site success by eliminating nest site competitors, cleaning out housing and configure for raising and lowering, and ensure that predator guards were placed on all the poles. At the same time, I also set some long-term goals. Increase the number of actively managed colonies, creating new source sites, and reducing the number of sink sites. Increase the quantity and quality of housing that could be managed, easy, more easily managed, by raising and lowering. Provide education and outreach to more Purple Martin landlords, a train-the-trainer approach and a realization of mutually beneficial relationships, as in neighbors realizing that they would benefit from more Martins willing to nest at their neighbor's sites as well, and those sub-adults returning to their sites. Success is measured by adding up the numbers. Averages created based on the first few years of mentoring and the average fledge rates. By increasing the number of landlords across the state, it also spreads out the management work, the expenses, and the time. As you can see, from 2010 to 2022, there was quite a jump in the number of landlords and using the average of 24 um, pairs hosted per site, we increased to 4,200 from the 2010 number of 52. 
a 4,416% increase. The number fledged increased from our total number in 2010 of 296 to the average of 16,093, a 5,436% increase. Compare this to a single landlord with a super colony with 300 pairs. On average, the number fledged from that colony would be around 1,125. This is still a smaller number compared to the 175 landlords and the number of fledged that they could produce. Again, it spreads out the management work, the expenses, and the time. This is a map of Missouri showing the average dispersal distances per the natal dispersal article on the PMCA's website. The inner circle represents a nine mile dispersal and the outer represents the 19 mile dispersal. These numbers are averages as noted in Mr. Hill's article using the Long Rangers. The dot on this map represents just my site and the average dispersal of my fledglings. This slide displays just 60 of the colonies that are now practicing man better management techniques. The remaining colonies that are not displayed here are clustered in the same areas covered by the current dots that you see here on this map. By improving management practices at colony sites scattered across Missouri, we have increased the coverage with scattered more successful sites and increased the number of fledglings as well as improve the chances for a landlord who is waiting for his first pair to start his own colony. A summary of accomplishments to date. We are paying it forward. Landlords are helping other landlords. A total of 175 landlords are now receiving my Puma newsletter and printing extras to even hand out to their friends. Landlords are now mentoring other landlords and the impact of my initial outreach effort is growing exponentially. Across the state, we have a huge reduction in English house sparrows and starlings that were previously allowed to nest. Our lessons learned. Along the way, I have learned a lot of lessons. <laughs> a lot of people still don't have access to the internet and can only be contacted via local newspapers or even regular mail. Not everyone uses Facebook or email. People like friendly competitions, hold drawings or small trivia games to compete for gourds, traps, PMCA memberships, etc. Hosting a Saturday morning purples and Purple Martins and Coffee event as your site is a good way to attract the locals around your area. Be prepared to provide landlords with less expensive options such as plans to build a homemade gourd rack or a house. Be prepared to address the very many myths out there as well, such as one about Purple Martins eat mosquitoes. If you have the means, you can also help out other landlords by purchasing equipment on sale yourself, then reselling it to landlords at half the price. I have found that people who have some amount of a monetary investment in their equipment are more apt to more to be more serious about hosting Purple Martins. What else can you can do? Take a drive, stop and introduce yourself, knock on the doors, a boots on the ground approach. It is more personal this way. Offer to help with modifications, house clean out, getting rid of nest site competitors. For example, you can loan traps or even help to trap or shoot if you're allowed. You can reach out to local and state publications. In Missouri, for example, it, we have the Rural Missouri Magazine and ask if they will do an article on your site. Spread the word. Contact your local newspapers editors and ask if you can submit an article. Include your contact information at the end of the article. Four newspapers currently provide full coverage for my area. Set up a public site. You can also host an open house event and give away free door prizes. Spread the word. 
even further. Contact your local Audubon groups, Boy and Girl Scout troops. Print out your personal print out personal business cards that you can hand out. Always have Puma literature in your car to hand out with your business card. Be brave. The worst they can say is no and stick with it. When people see how passionate you are about Purple Martins, that feeling is often contagious. Moving on to the next portion of my presentation, Good Fences Make Good Neighbors, Life with a Great Horned Owl. Some background about my Great Horned Owl. I first discovered the presence of a Great Horned Owl here in my colony in 2014. He was, I, I initially had an instinct that something was going on in my colony, and after deploying game cameras to monitor each gourd rack and housing system, it was confirmed that yes, indeed, I had a great horned owl that was, had become hyper-focused on my trendsetter. Uh, what I found was neither tunnels on my horizontal gourds, nor the 90 degree entrance turns in my trendsetter housing helped because the owl would grab the house or the gourds and flush them out eventually and grab them as they exited their housing. From 2014 until March of 2016, I deployed many passive measures that worked for short periods of time, only short measure, only short periods of time, until the great horned owl eventually adapted to them. Lights, radio, lights and radio, motion detection lights, scarecrows, and even an audio of household sounds such as door slamming, my husband and I talking, yelling, throwing down wind chimes, etc. All of those eventually failed. By 2016, I decided to replace the trendsetter, which was her favorite target, with a gourd rack. And I then enclosed all of my three gourd racks with wire caging. So what did I learn from everything that I experienced with this great horned owl over the last eight years? Monitor your site. Primarily, that is the most important thing you can do to determine whether you even have a great horned owl, firstly, and secondly, to determine how your anti-owl measures are working. Don't try to guess whether you have a problem or not. Use game cameras or security cameras and record video from dusk till dawn. A second lesson learned, and a critical one, place your fencing at least 12 to 13 inches away from your gourd and housing entrances. If the owl has already eaten martens at your site, passive measures, any types of lights, radios, etc., will not stop her or him. You can reduce the owl's ability to detect and home in on a marten with the dancing man motor or continuous radio noise, but once the marten is spotted, the owl will attack. Another lesson learned is make sure you enclose the bottom and the top of your cages. In conclusion, again, after eight years spent with this owl, I have determined cages are the most effective deterrent as long as your martens stay inside. For example, martens are still vulnerable departing for and returning from dawn song, or if they perch on the side or the top of the cage. Yes, you will still lose a few martens, but your colony will not be slaughtered or devastated as it would have if you had left the housing unprotected. And I knew this because in 2014, I went from losing almost 12 total pairs in my trendsetter to now only losing four to eight birds each year. Thank you for your attention, and I will turn it over now for questions. Hey, Kathy. Hey, Joe. Thank you so much for submitting your talk. Uh, quite, quite an ordeal that you've had to deal with with the owl, obviously. Uh, how did this season go with the owl? Um, you know, she or he was up to his old tricks, um, but... And we, and we suffered some losses. I think around this year, we had eight losses that I could account for on the video. Um, I got much better cameras this year, so I can count them better. <laughs> but um, 
the, the good news is, you know, as you could see in the last picture, they could come out on their porch and she couldn't just reach up and grab them. She actually had to wait uh, for them to exit. Uh, Don song, Don song time is really tough. Um, I, I get up a lot at 4 a.m. <laughs> because that's when they start and uh, try to run her off. But uh, she's persistent. Oh, my gosh. Um, a couple of questions popping up here in chat uh, from Terry. Uh, you elaborated on your owl cages, but would you address your snake netting trap that's similar to the, the cronky netting trap? How bad is it? Uh, how bad a situation is it for you and rat snakes? How successful has your netting trap been this season? So um, I use the predator guard that uh, sold by the PMCA on my three inch pole, the, the baffle uh, with netting above the baffle. And uh, I've been a landlord for, I guess, 15 or 16 years now. And I've never had a snake uh, caught in my netting. And I'm not sure if it's because they're not as big as they are in the South. Uh, but we, I have a um, prairie king snake that lives in the bed about 75 feet from my colony, and it's never been up that uh, any of my poles. I have a speckled green snake that lives a little further over, and then I have black rat snakes living in my um, landscape bed. <laughs> so I, I haven't uh, caught any snakes in any of well, my Yeah, we'll consider that a, a success, and uh, sounds like the Predator Guard is doing its job. One thing that folks need to make sure uh, when they have their Predator Guards on that they're mounted high enough. You want the, the top of it four feet or above. And a, a, admittedly, when you're in the Deep South, there are some pretty big snakes that potentially could get enough leverage on their tail to, to get up and over. And that's when folks tend to put in those kind of netting traps uh, above the predator guard as insurance, right? And just in case somebody scoots past, absolutely. Uh, you get them. Uh, my my predator baffle is is mounted as high as I can reach on my pole. <laughs> exactly, that's what we yeah. recommend. You know, just you can barely get it. That's right. perfect, right? <laughs> yeah. So no problems with snakes here. All right. Um, question from Bobette: uh, What cameras are you using? Um, Real Link, and. Link. Yeah, um, I got the those uh, last year, and I just really love them. I really hated the FOSS cams that I had before, but Real Link has good quality uh, video. They have great uh, software that comes with them for um, being able to set up nighttime video. And and the best this was the best part with Real Link was that I could use the zoom on them to get in closer to the cages to see uh, what the owl was actually doing. Um, you know, if she was. I, I know um, when I when I first just figured out that she was getting up inside the cage, um, using the cameras is how I figured out that I needed to put um, netting across the bottom. And and about the netting across the bottom, I only had to do a 12 by 14 openings. It's like it looks like a cargo net. Um, and the the owl never went up inside that netting. And I'm not sure if she would just be embarrassed to be caught in such a redneck trap, or um, <laughs> or she was really afraid of getting tangled up in that mess. But anyway, yeah, the real link cameras. And I'll post a, a, a link to those on the PMCA Facebook page. That's, that sounds great. Yeah, actually, that's the brand that we use for our Nest Cams. We modify them, of course, but um, we've had good luck. And previously, we tried FOSS Cams and we're unhappy with them. So we've, we've yeah. gone down the same road. Yeah. Uh, D. Kirk in chat, how far are the gourds from your house? 75 feet 75 feet okay. just about the range i my pellet rifle is sighted in for <laughs> for the english house sparrows and starlings yeah not for the owl no um all right uh bert asks what's the spacing used in your metal cage grids um so what's the what's the mesh oh size? okay i understand what you say um so i posted this on my blog site exactly how i constructed the cages but the mesh in general is uh two inches wide by four inches high, but where it is in front of all the gourds entrances, of course I have it 12 to 13 inches back, but I actually cut out an additional wire to make it a four by four square where, and I mounted under sill trim on the bottom of that square for a better perch entrance and exit for the purple martins. But those four by fours are only cut out around the, the gourds themselves. 
Gotcha. Well, you take care of those birds, don't you? My, uh, <laughs> uh, John Miller. Uh, hi, John. Says, great presentation, Kathy. Missouri birds are the best. Oh, thanks, John. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> All right. Uh, we've got a few more uh, questions in chat. I'll let you handle them uh, uh, after after uh, sure. uh, we go on to the next session here. But thank you so much, Kathy. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Joe. Thank awesome. you. Bye-bye.